Hey Dennis, for my Wednesday video this week, I do want to do an industry look, but I also want to change the format a little bit. I want to talk about The Four, which is the new Scott Galloway book. I actually finished it within the same week that I got it. I was hooked. It is so good, but I want to take some time to digest it and then also make some notes so that I could do a, a longer format discussion because... Uh, I think it's extremely well written and it and it ties in so well with what I try to cover on this channel which I do cover the newest brands that are out there on the internet but I also try to also provide additional information on what is happening in the retail industry as a whole and that is the lens that I want to look at this book through. I've mentioned in the past my adornment for Professor Galloway. I actually went back in my YouTube history and looked the very first time I watched one of his videos on the Four Horsemen concept was back in 2012. And so I've been tracking him and L2 since really the inception of that company. And so this is really the culmination of all the things that he's taught in his MBA course and then also what he's done on his YouTube channel. So I would just wanna talk about the top takeaways from the book. Number one, Amazon is a force to be reckoned with. They are not impossible to compete against, but they are very challenging because they are leading the wave of the shift in consumer preference for shopping, but also just retail shift as a whole. So e-commerce was going to happen to retail, Jeff Bezos and Amazon just happen to be at the forefront of that. And so it is possible to combat them. And you're gonna, we'll talk a little bit about how Walmart is starting to do a little bit of that. But the number one is Amazon is an, an absolute dominant force. The second is his body analogy that he makes. So the four things that you need to cater to as a company, either the brain, the heart, the gut, or sex. And he makes analogies as to how the four play into those. So you either have to compete for the logical brain, you either have to compete for the heart, which is like Facebook, they talk about relationships and social, the gut or sex, which is luxury brands. And in this case, he talks about Apple, or you could put any of luxury brand in there, like Rolex or Louis Vuitton or, or any of those luxury companies. And so playing to one of those things is really how you figure out what your competition is. The third is he gives incredible advice on how to consider your career, especially if you're someone young like myself, and what what, what way to direct yourself. You know, and, and there's an entire chapter in here, and I'll talk about that as we go through. To really kick off here, uh, the book is about how the current four horsemen or the most valuable companies in the world have DNA that sets them apart from previous companies that have uh, competed in the space and how they've decimated tons of jobs and how they've also built incredible value based on removing some of the cruft of the old world. And so what this really highlights is just a, a macroeconomic shift into new paradigms of consumer patterns of behavior and purchases and just uh, it's these four companies that have taken advantage of that change. So I just want to go through some of my notes here now and in First, we'll talk about the book itself. I am not a reader. I am a very uh, visual learner, and uh, I didn't even read this book. I listened to this book on Audible. I made notes in the Audible app, and I then translated them into these post-it notes so that I could do this discussion. What I would say about the book is that it is an incredible culmination of all of the research and information that Scott Galloway has been putting out for the past five plus, you know, or however long he's been teaching, 20 years. But if you are a visual learner like me, I would recommend instead of getting the book, get the book, support Scott Galloway. But all of the information that is in this book has been presented on his YouTube channel, the L2 YouTube channel, and in some of his TED Talks over the past few years. I think it would take just as long to watch all of those as it did for me to listen to the book. I listen at two times speed, so maybe not exactly, or to sit down and read the book. So this is a great, you know, this for the executives that don't watch YouTube videos, this is a great way to get his name out there because there's a lot more recognition in this than if he was just continue to publish YouTube videos. But I'd say if you want the information in this book, uh, we'll talk about it in, in, in this little chat here, but a lot of it is on YouTube and you can get all of the points of the book from watching those videos. And he's just, he's a very dynamic and a very charismatic person, especially on camera. And so I think you would do yourself a disservice not to watch a few of his videos and see some of the things that he talks about. The first note that I have here is an excellent summary in the six stages that we've gone through in retailing over the past 150 or so years. And the first 
first is the corner store. So originally you had the corner store, you go down, that's where you had your delis and you would buy your clothes there and, and everything would be at the corner store. Typically you'd shop daily. After the corner stores, you then moved to department stores and department stores originally were family owned as well as the corner stores. And the key here was that you had a lot of stuff under one roof. Selfridges was really the beginning of this and he talks about how it permeated through Europe and then over to the US and the notion of differentiation through service was key at these. So you had a lot of stuff under one roof. You had a lot of representatives that were able to help inform you. They were based on commission, which was a new concept at the time. And then Harry Selfridge was the one who coined the phrase, customer is always right. And that focus on the customer we'll get back to because that plays into the Amazon thing. Then you move to, the, he calls it the call of the mall. So as the mid-century came, the car and refrigerator meant that they could we could drive further and we could get more stuff more safely and uh, we, could, we could keep it as well. And so that was the rise of the mall, which, you know, mid-century, I'd say 70s was really the, the key there. And he, he does highlight an interesting statistic that 44% of the value in U.S. malls is in just 100 places. And I've said this before, if your mall has an Apple store or a Tesla store or a coach or a, if they have luxury stores, plural, then that mall is probably going to be fine. It's the class C and D malls that have low sales per square foot. Those are the ones usually in, in lower population suburban areas. Those are the ones that are struggling and will likely close in the next five years because they can't compete in this new paradigm. Then you move to the big box, which did start in 1962. And that's when you have the Walmarts, the Targets, the Kmarts, the Sears, and all those stores. Now, uh, he does mention that in the 60s, lawmakers correctly feared that it would put thousands of local stores out of business, which it did. And then Walmart came in and have this like cutthroat race to the bottom. He highlights that H&M even has as, uh, you know, a $10 turtleneck on the website. And that's just through just vast, vast supply chain expertise. Then you move to specialty retail and specialty retail is the newest. Those are, you know, I think of, especially in women's wear, you have uh, Chico's and you have Lane Bryant and you've got these stores that are dedicated to the brand itself, but the leader in this was Gap. So Gap was really the first company to come in and position themselves as the lifestyle brand. And coincidentally, these are the newest retailers of the group, but they're also having the easiest transition into the world of e-commerce because they do have identifiable branding and also loyalty with the customer because they have a one-to-one -one relationship. You used to go to a department store because you wanted the wide assortment. You weren't necessarily going to a department store for something in particular or a particular brand. They, they're, they're starting to get to that now, but these are the companies that are having the easiest transition into e-commerce. And you know, customers want to go to these stores because they want to be special. They don't want to buy their clothes at Walmart. They want to go to a specialty store in order to get a different experience. Experience. And this is, you know, the mid-tier things. There's there's an additional layer of that, which is luxury. And he talks about how, you know, if you shop at Pottery Barn or you shop at Williams Sonoma, you are signaling that you have a special interest in cooking or uh, it's, it's a signal to others. Now you have the e-commerce opportunity. And this is when you talk about Amazon being the one to ride the wave into this new store. So in the in the days of the department store, the first movers would have been JCPenney, Lazarus, Macy's. And those are the the companies that continue to remain dominant today. And now you've got an entirely new horizon, which is the e-commerce and that's Amazon. And so the, the comment here is, uh, each of the preceding eras of retail, there were brilliant people who tapped into a shift in demographics or taste and created billions of dollars in value. Those are the Macy's and the Jay-Z Pennies of the world. They were the ones to tap into that. And so, you know, Bezos saw a technological shift, used it to reconstruct root and branch the entire world of retailing. He does bring up flashlights like guilt. I mean, that was a new paradigm at one point, but those are largely fueled by the poor economy. And the key that he highlights here is that Amazon's real competitive moat against all these other companies is the fact that it has the marketplace. So it's not that Amazon is producing all of the products that it sells and it's not producing all of these new brands. It's the fact that I can start a company tomorrow, list it on Amazon and reach more customers than Macy's or JCPenney could have ever hoped for because they were limited to physical stores. Whereas uh, in, in the e-commerce space, I can just buy Facebook ads and I can reach millions of people very quickly. And so that is the scary stuff. They also leverage the fact that they're a digital company and they have this loop and, and it's labeled here as the military OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, and act. So a lot of other companies don't have the speed at which Amazon continues to push forward 
but you know, Amazon does. So let's just shift here. There's a couple of really good charts and this is some of the stuff that he covers in his YouTube videos. So it shows the 2006 to 2016 stock growth of all these companies. So you can see down here, Amazon has had a 1,900% increase while all of these traditional retailers have all lost value. So it is a zero sum game. And then talks about the stock price change. Uh, on, you know, Amazon went up 3% on in one day while jc penny nordstrom dillard macy's and kmart all lost an average of 10 percent in stock price so that's just investors signaling that they understand the shift and they're trying to get uh, in as part of that now there's another interesting chart and let's take my uh, little post-it note off here that in an interview with charlie rose in 2012 jeff bezos mentions that something that amazon wants to get into is fashion and retailing. And at the time, he also, in that same conversation, he says, you know, we think of business units as having seven to 10 year time horizons before they ever become profitable. So it wasn't like Jeff Bezos said, hey, let's start making fashion and apparel and let's turn a profit next year. He said, let's start making fashion and apparel in 2022, that's when I want to see returns. So it shows in this chart, the share of Amazon's apparel and accessories business and you can see the inflection point over here so 2011 this is when jeff bezos mentions it on the charlie rose show and then it's just a line right up for amazon there and i would expect that to be even more hockey stick like coming soon because they've continued to launch new brands and that's some of the stuff that i've talked about on the channel here jump over here. This is one way that Walmart has been starting to compete a little bit more against Amazon, taking a page out of their playbook. So he talks about storytelling being capital. And I think this is important because if you talk about Amazon, you don't just talk about the fact that they have Amazon Prime and you buy stuff off there all the time. You talk about the fact that they have drones, that they are now starting to lease full cargo planes in order to ship things. They've got the fastest shipping out there. And so they're, Amazon's really good at telling stories about how innovative they are. And Walmart has taken a page from that in order to continue to try and combat Amazon's dominance in this space. So uh, Walmart announced the fact that they were going to have uh, increased prices online versus in stores on, on Black Friday. And I, I, there, I went back and forth on Twitter with this where the fact that they even announced that is, is surprising because in the past they would have just raised the prices, taken the extra margin, but because they're trying to get their story out and trying to uh, cater more to Wall Street because that's they're getting hammered in valuation as Amazon has risen. Uh, that is one way that Walmart is starting to compete and one way that other retailers can compete. And you're starting to see that too with uh, the Kohl's announced that they are going to have Amazon stores within there where you can take returns back and everything. I think that's something to watch. I think you gotta watch out for that for that Kohl's relationship. Uh, a quick interesting stat, Amazon Prime monthly spend. You're going to see companies like Jet and Walmart start to have something similar to Prime because it is so lucrative to uh, Amazon and Jeff and um, Scott Galloway has mentioned that in the past that as soon as Amazon announces that the average monthly Prime spend tops $1,000, the stock will be anti-gravity and just uh, shoot up in the world. Uh, there is a whole chapter on the loss of retailing jobs and how the fact that uh, you know, warehouse jobs aren't really gonna replace those and there are over 6 million people employed in the retail space that are about to see some uh, scary stuff coming up. Now, for luxury, and, and this is in the context of Apple, one of the things that he mentions it is from 1997 to 2005, Gap more than tripled in revenue from 6.5 billion to 16 billion, largely by the fact that they had built these temples to the brands. They had built all the stores. Levi, and they, and he equates this as Levi was a bigger company in 1997. They did not invest in stores. They built out their wholesale strategy, and they, uh, ten years later, were at 4.1 billion compared to Gap's 16 billion. And so, talking about how you need to have this it's brand equity, you need to have this direct relationship with a customer, and that's why Gap has one of the better way, one of the better moats as they enter the e-commerce space uh, versus somebody who is exclusively selling through a wholesaler, and now you're starting to see a little bit of that uh, start to change. Oh, and I like, I really like this anecdote. So 
I love the comments. I love every comment that you guys have. I read every comment. I can't reply to all of them because it has become a little bit overwhelming. But when you guys talk about it, I've, I've heard it mentioned the big three YouTube channels, right? You've got uh, a very large, and, and not just them, but on YouTube in general, you've got people that will do videos for sponsored things. They're not always clear if they're sponsored or not. And like, I would never, I never do sponsored reviews. That is an oxymoron. You can't do a review and have it sponsored because then it's, what the hell is that? And I love this anecdote about Google. So the way that Google rose to the top and became the most powerful search engine out there is that consumers trusted it. And I love this anecdote here is that he says, while meanwhile, users realized they were getting the best answer, not the one most paid for. It was as if to continue the biblical analogy, they were seeing the way, the truth and the light. And I think about that in the context of YouTube is that what I'm trying to do on this channel is to give you the truth and give you the best answer. And just, you know, if you want to know about Stitch Fix, I have 40 minutes of Stitch Fix videos on my channel. I don't want to gl uh, gloss over things. You know, if I do a made to measure company, I want to give the best information. And so that's what I'm really trying to do on my channel. And that, that, that just really resonated with me. And I hope that uh, it seems like, you know, everybody seems to get it. That sticks around on the channel here. Uh, there's a nice chapter on the fact that uh, Am America's DNA is in theft of manufacturing, and that's what's created us as a power, as an innovation powerhouse. And uh, I don't have a lot of notes on that one. I just thought that was uh, a very interesting historical anecdote. And then chapter eight, they ta he talks about the T algorithm, and uh, this is another one where I'm pretty sure there's a YouTube video on it. But the T algorithm is how to to essentially uh, create or fight to become a trillion dollar company. And a lot of that is based on what Amazon has already done. So number one is product differentiation, visionary capital. You see that a lot with Tesla. So they are able to get so many investors and able to raise so much money because uh, they're putting out this low cost Model 3 and they have their new Roadster, which does 600 miles on a charge, which is amazing. And the Tesla semi truck. So visionary capital is a key component to that because that's what gets Wall Street on board. Global reach, easy one. Actually, Amazon has about 30% of their revenue coming from outside the US. So they have huge upside opportunity as they grow. Likeability, and he talks about this in the context of Uber, is the fact that Uber has a lot of the things in this T algorithm, but they don't have the likeability factor. Vertical integration, artificial intelligence, accelerant, and so that is being able to use that visionary capital to talk about the company that you're building and then also be able to retain talent and get talent, and then geography. And he says, you know, there's a, there's a reason that so many of these technology companies are within a bike ride of major universities because it, the talent is in those certain places and uh, you got to be able to attract certain talent within there. So I really like that, the T algorithm. It's a good way to uh, borrow some of the DNA of these major companies. And then chapter 10, I, I kind of want to do a whole video on chapter 10. Chapter 10 is all about the things that Scott Galloway recommends you take into account as you look at a future profession and you look at what you want to do in order to maximize your value to a company or maximize your own personal development and growth. Uh, I'll just hit a, on a couple of them and there, I think I'll link to a video where he just hits all of these in one video and there's the graphics and everything. But number one is go to college. Number two, if you don't go to college, get certification. So have a way to say, I am an expert or I am trained in this field so that you can differentiate yourself from others out there. If you can't go to an Ivy League school and you're just gonna go to a middle of the road school, maybe get a certification because that's, that's going to be more powerful as you specialize in a certain profession. Uh, the accomplishment habit, so just get used to putting in the work, don't take shortcuts, get rich quick screams, that stuff never really works. Get to a city and you're starting to see this now, there's a lot of urbanization of the millennial generation because we're realizing there's a lot of energy in cities and that's where all of the economic driving is coming uh, within there. Uh, get equity in the company. So if it is a young company, make sure that's as part of your plan. Serial monogamy, stay loyal to people, not companies, not corporations. Manage your career, so take responsibility for it, get extra training, uh, connect with people online, do extracurricular work activities. A lot of ways that my channel is my way of managing my career because I'm trying to make sure that uh, I have an additional outlet, an additional way that I can kind of 
you know, promote myself in a way. And I can, and I've, got, I've built this incredible network with you guys and it's just the best thing. And then uh, one that really, I, I've thought about this over and over since I first heard this concept is, is choose if you want a sexy job or if you want an ROI. If you want a sexy job, which would be like in the film or the film and, if you want a sexy job, think like working in the film industry or working in television or uh, something to that nature where you would be, you you would get personal satisfaction out of be, being able to say, I do this. And in some ways that is retail for me. I really love working with these major brands to say, you know, I worked with The Gap and and there's, there's a lot of that side to it, but that's the sexy job versus an ROI. If you want to do, uh, database optimization for a healthcare company that's not a sexy job but that's where the money is and he says that's in one of his i think it was an interview or one of his youtube videos is if, a, if a, somebody comes up and they want to create a new media or an advertising company that's cool go off and do it yourself but if you are looking at eliminating um, medicare expenses through process optimization that's where he smells money and he wants to invest in a company in that space and so just for, from being a, a young guy and having an interest in trying to make the most out of my own career i found that to be extremely powerful uh, of a chapter and i would encourage you to find that um, video on youtube i'll put that i'll try and put that down in the link below so this is scott galloway uh, i really enjoyed the book if you have watched and followed him for a while i think it is a triumph to get it all into one book and be able to then take pieces of that at, if, either if you're building a company or if you want to push yourself forward or if you just want to understand how these four companies that are relatively young i mean facebook is just over 10 years old Google, 15, right, 1997, I think. Uh, you know, all of these companies are less than 30 years old, but they're all now some of the most valuable companies in the world. And it is a great way, it's a great education, and it's it's very sharply written. It has some humor in there. He talks about how he took an Uber helicopter when he was in Cannes. And so there's just, it's, it's an extremely well-written book, and, it, and it's imminently fascinating the way that he puts things into context. And I would encourage you to at least check out L2, and uh, let me know what you think of this book chat. I try to read two books a month, and so um, maybe I could do a little bit more organization around, you know, one of my biggest challenges is that I read a lot of books, but I don't take notes. Or I take, I read a lot of books, I take a lot of notes, but I never translate those into some sort of action. And so maybe if I were to do this monthly, I would, uh, it would force myself to do that, so. Uh, let me know if you guys want to try and organize a book club because I mostly try to read nonfiction business and then I'll try to read something off on the side. Like right now, I'm doing a world, I'm reading the story of World War II. Fascinating, but uh, I just finished this too. So now I'm just rambling and I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know what your comments are on the four, on Scott Galloway, on the retail industry. I've got some really cool ideas for what I want to tackle on my Wednesday videos coming up and for the five of you that have stuck around to the end of this video uh, thank you very much and until next time gents this is the Cavalier.